Welcome everybody to our monthly webinar from eExtension, uh, the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob and I'm at the University of Kentucky and I coordinate the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension and as such organize our monthly webinars. This month's webinar is on raising um, quail for meat or release. And our speaker is a fellow uh, person from Kentucky, Dr. Tony Pescatori. He's going to be doing the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A. If at any time you have a question, please um, type it in the chat box or in the Q&A. And um, I will, uh, if it's related to what he is talking about at the time, I will interrupt him for a clarification. If it is not related to what he's talking about at that time, I'll hold it till the end. So you can put your questions in the Q&A box or you can type it in the chat box. Either one works. Um, so again, Dr. Pescatori, thank you for agreeing to do this. And it's all yours. I will be on mute. If I pop back up again, that means that somebody has a clarification. All right, thank you, Dr. Jacob. I would like to uh, welcome everybody. And today we're gonna talk about quail and particularly for raising meat and flight. Uh, those are two specific things that we do raise quail for. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about Bob White quail uh, because of the flight size. But from the meat end, we could also apply this to uh, Coternix quails, many of the same principles that we're going to use for ra raising birds are going to be uh, uh, for both, both for uh, Bob White quail, uh, quail, other quails as well for release, but for meat, it could also be the Coternix quail. So my first question to you is, how is your operation viewed in the eyes of the government? Is it a poultry operation? Is it a captive wildlife operation? Is it a farming and agriculture operation? Is it a recreational operation? When we start dealing with animals like quails, these are starts to be questions that regulators in your state start looking at. So you need to really think about is your, you know, we want to think about raising birds as a poultry operation or agricultural operation. But uh, there are uh, divisions of the government that view it as a wildlife operation or maybe even a uh, recreational operation. How do your view views this has many implications regarding the regulations you have to operate under and taxation. So this is a very important thing that you need to understand as you get into the quail business or even if you're in the quail business that you meet the regulations regarding quail. Who's responsible in your state? For a lot of these, I'm going to use the Kentucky as the example, and many of the states that you are, are from are also going to have similar things. So if we're going to raise a Bob White quail in the state of Kentucky, we have two different directions that goes into regulations. The Department of Agriculture regulates quail production as poultry. So the same rules that evolve for the poultry industry and for the importation and raising of chickens and turkeys and more traditional poultry play a role. On the other hand, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Division views it as captive wildlife. So we have this one bird being regulated in two different directions. So what does that mean to your operation to, that is part of agricultural, but also part of captive wildlife? So what does that mean? So in our state, if you have captive wildlife, you have to have a permit to possess 
a live native wildlife. A person shall only obtain native wildlife through legal means or properly permitted commercial breeders. So this is one of those things where it's got to be uh, obtained either if you're trapping them in during the legal system or you have to buy them from commercial be, uh, uh, breeder. In our state, it's illegal to remove young wildlife from the wild. Uh, and we actually, with captive wildlife, we have commercial and non-commercial. A commercial captive wildlife permit is required for a person who sells or offers to sell or trade or barters native wildlife. So for most commercial operations that are going to raise quail for meat and, and, uh, and flight, they're going to come under a commercial wildlife permit. And a person cannot sell wildlife, uh, wild caught uh, birds. They can only be captive bred native wildlife that's that is commercially offered. In our state, we have an exemption for bobwhite quail that 100 or fewer bobwhite quails can be possessed for personal use without a permit, provided the birds are not propagated or sold or uh, they're illegally obtained and their confinement facilities meet the regulatory requirements. So all this takes in the point is that if you're gonna get into the quail business, what even if it's not uh, native quail to our state, they're looked on part as captive wildlife. And I have talked to some people that, that view the, that any quail requires this classification. So in our state would cap the permit the nor with the exemption for northern quail, uh, bobwhite quail. They can be possessed for 100 or less, but they cannot be propagated. You must possess a receipt for proof of purchase. A purchase, uh, a person possess possessing northern bobwhite for dog training areas or shoot to train sessions must comply with the requirements and the confinement facilities have to be up to step. So even if you have this exemption, you still have to meet the uh, other requirements. And within our regulations under the fish and wildlife, not under agriculture, there are certain requirements for a facility. And these are probably good ideas to begin with for just management of the birds themselves. The, uh, the first thing is the pen or enclosure has to prevent the escape of native animals, uh, of captive animals. So you have to maintain your population. You have to protect, uh, protect the caged animal or the, the confined animals from injury or predators. Again, something's new. And, the, and it must be for, prevent the entrance of wild birds of the same species. And then they also have some, ha they have some management guides in there. They have to uh, maintain in an, uh, 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 they must be, uh, they cannot be maintained in unsanitary or unsafe commission, uh, uh, conditions or mistreated. We can all live with that. And native wildlife cannot be uh, maintained in something that doesn't meet the following characteristics. One is the enclosure must have clean drinking water and it be provided daily in clean containers. I think that's a management we can live with. Any cage or closure shall have adequate surface dra water drainage so we don't have any puddling of water, which is very important when we start talking about flight vents. Captive birds must be fed daily and the food should be of the type and quantity that meets the nutritional requirements. And it must be uncontaminated or unspoiled and in a feeding camera that's kept clean with un, uh, uneaten food removed in a reasonable time. It also requires that the shelter be provided for security and production in inclement uh, in, uh, weather and that shade structures are added in warm seasons 
and then fecal materials maintained in sanitary conditions. So those are all things that are in the law to protect uh, captive wildlife, but are also good husbandry that we should be doing for our animals to begin with. One of the unique things about our law is that uh, for a northern bobwhite quail older than 14 weeks of age, the enclosure for one single quail is 100 square feet and then must be increased by one square foot per bird and for each additional bird. During breeding season, they can keep them in smaller pens. However, when you start working about it, that one square foot per bird is probably the right size for, uh, it, for what we're trying to do. So on a, on a hundred bird flock, our 100 bird thing, we would have about 199 square feet. On a thousand, uh, we would have about uh, 1,090 square foot for a thousand bird population. But that's one of the requirements. So in our state, that is what we have to meet. Importation of game birds is also regulated. It's regulated by both the fisheries and wildlife and it's done by agriculture. And this is probably true in your state or in our state as it is. We have to have a, a permit for holding a, 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 the permit, the we have to have a transportation permit from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we also have to abide by the Department of Agriculture's entry requirements particularly uh, concerning MPIP, National Poultry Improvement Plan, and the uh, MPIP H5, H7 uh, clean flocks. So all these are requirements so that we not only have to have transportation permits, but we also have to have uh, the state requirements. And I think people don't realize that when we start dealing with wildlife, what, what can be compared as captive wildlife, and this applies for the, all the squails, is that you have to have a transportation permit. If you're receiving a shipment of, of, of wildlife, which includes quail, you have to have a permit. You can have an individual permit, which is a one-time shipment, or you can do have an annual wildlife transportation permit. Oh, but either one uh, will, if you're doing lots of shipments, you do want to have the annual. But one of the things that is a gray area in our state, and you may want to check with your own states, is that each shipment has to be accompanied by a certificate of veterinary inspection. However, it's not clear whether or not the forms or the 9-3 form for the National Poultry Improvement Plan will substitute for that certificate of veterinarian inspection. <clears throat> the captive wildlife permits, we can have non-commercial or commercial. If we're non-commercial, that means you're not selling or transporting or or uh, uh, propagating the birds. Commercial captive is, a, is good for a year and the holding facilities have to be dis, uh, properly designed. They ha you have to have a, uh, that permit now is $150. But the important thing that uh, if we're going to keep these birds and have captive wildlife permit, it requires that records for the captive bred and wild captivated wildlife be kept for five years. So there's a five year uh, commitment to the records. We also, and when you have this, the facilities have to be inspected by a conservation officer who has to sign the permit. So this is another step that we have to take if we're going to raise quail. And this applies to many states and may have even more. 
The wildlife permit, uh, transportation permit, can be done online. Again, it's a annual or one-time permit. We also have to not only look at the regulations, we got to look at the tax issues. And I'll use Kentucky as an example. In our state, sales tax exemptions apply to animals for breeding purposes. It applies to animals that are produced for food and some of the supplies and the equipment that are associated with producing those animals are also tax exempt. What's not sales tax exempt is animals for recreation or animals produced for flight. And the supplies and equipment that are used to produce those animals may not be tax exempt. So it's very important that you check with your tax professional concerning your tax situation if you're getting into the quail business or any type of wildlife business because it has implications on taxes, both for the sales tax and your own personal taxes. So with all that said, before you start an operation, it's very important that you know your state laws and regulations and do not rely on only one source. Ask many sources to make sure that they do not have jurisdiction over the operation you're doing. You do not want to get in a situation where you can be fined or the birds be confiscated or you have tax liabilities. This can happen very easily. As an example, well, not with quail, but with wild turkeys in our state, you are, pre you are pre prevented from whole, uh, having wild turkeys in your uh, possession. So we have people that order wild turkeys online, they come in, well, those birds will get confiscated and, those bir and for each day you had the bird, you will be fined $500. So these laws do have teeth behind them uh, to protect the wildlife, but we need to know you need to know what your state laws are. With that said, it's still a great opportunity to generate income and it is a good lifestyle. So if we're going to talk about uh, the quail itself, what characteristics do we want in quail? So if we're raising me a birds for meat, we want good livability. We want good feed efficiency. We want good meat yield. And we want calm birds. Those are all characteristics of an animal that we want. We want good body size on that animal. We want them to be efficient and put on weight. We want good livability. And we want the birds to not spend a lot of energy being uh, aggressive. If those are the characteristics we want in a meat bird, how does that translate to the characteristics that we want for a bird for flight? Well, just like the meat bird, we want good livability and we want good feed efficiency, but that's where the difference comes in, is that one of the things that we need in a bird of flight that's for release is a good feather cover. And I always talk, I think about an old quail farmer that told me that if you're raising them for meat, you're trying to get meat. If you're raising them for flight, you're in the business of growing feathers. You also want a lighter bird, a bird that's active and has the ability to fly. And you want to uh, train that bird or have that bird be able to utilize a ground cover. When you start looking at it this way as raising birds for meat or raising birds for flight, you might start thinking about, do I need different types of birds for different markets? The characteristics are different for the different purposes. So what are the things that we need to, see, the, to succeed? First, we need quality birds. 
We want birds that have the genetics for the end purpose. While we would love to have a nice calm bird when we're in the meat business, that's not the type of bird you want in the flight birds. So you want to find the genetics and the quality of the bird that you need for your operation. Once that you find that, you need to have a reliable source of the chicks. This can be done by buying from an outside breeder and bringing chicks into your farm or bringing eggs into your farm and you hatching them. Or if you have the desire, you can have your own breeder flock. Any one of those is, is a good alternative as long as it's reliable and it meets all, when you bring birds in, they all meet the regulations of your state in regards to health, uh, uh, certifications, and the type of bird uh, and then the permits that you have. But a reliable source and a good source is important, especially if you're getting into a business for the first time is get good birds. You cannot buy, you can never fix a, a bad chick with time. A, a, a bird that doesn't get a good start will never recover. Another thing is we need proper housing. What is proper housing? It depends on the, the age of the bird as we move through their life cycle, the type of housing. Something that provides shelter for the chicks and then the type of housing after that. We need a potable water source. Good clean water is very important. So also the quality of the feed that you're providing those animals. The quail, it, the quail eat a lot of feed for their body size. So don't be shocked when you find out that they almost eat as much feed as a chicken, even for their small size. So they do have a large consumption, but they are, and they don't have quite the efficiencies, but a good quality feed will solve a lot of problems. Because of uh, the, the we need a good biosecurity plan. We are, a biosecurity plan prevents diseases, it keeps your birds safe, and it's very important on these game bird farms to have good biosecurity because you do have a lot of birds moving off at different times or coming in, and that's part of your biosecurity plan. Disease prevention is very important as well because the quails are very susceptible to intestinal uh, diseases, such as the enteritis and coccidiosis. So we worry about that as being a part of that disease prevention. And you need a reliable market, whether we're producing meat or we're re re producing flight birds, you need a reliable, profitable market. You know, you not have to know where you're gonna go with your birds when you place your birds. Don't wait to find what the market is after you have an investment in those birds, particularly in the flight bird industry. The flight bird industry is very fickle in my experiences. Make sure you have some, uh, you contract some of your birds so that you have a reliable market because that is also an, a market where you can undercut every, you, people can undercut you because the birds don't have any processing cost into them. The meat industry, if you have a reliable market, make sure you know that they're going to take your birds, how they want them processed and how they want them packaged so that you meet their needs. Let's look at nutrition. That's probably one of the places where we mess up the bird as fast as anywhere. If we look at the nutrient requirements for bobwhite quail and these will transport to other quails, we can have different stages of growth 
and we have a different types of nutrient requirements. One of the things about the bobwhite quail is that it has an early protein requirement. In fact, their, their nutritional requirements are more closer related to turkeys than they are to chickens. So when you start thinking about it, you're feeding that little quail like a turkey, not like a chicken. So we like to start out with a, 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 a good protein. And these are the NRC requirements for Bob White quail. We, we have 20 for the first six weeks, after six weeks and then breeding. We can step down our protein after six weeks to 20%. Breeding, we go back up in protein. Calcium, we're about 0.65% calcium. It goes up to 2.4 in breeding. The same as phosphorus is 0.4% available phosphorus. Uh, it goes down to 0.3. Salt is very important. Uh, 0.15%. Sodium is really important for a couple of uh, uh, the salt in the diet is very important. One, a lack of salt in the diet will cause, uh, will trigger cannibalism. And it can also put layers out of egg production. So salt is very important with that. And also the trace minerals are very important. If we're trying to raise flight birds, we're trying to uh, have a, a good integrity of the skin and we have good feather production, we're trying to produce meat, we're trying to have that as well. So here's some sample Bob White quail diets. If you look at it, the main ingredient in these diets are uh, corn, Soy, so corn is an energy source. The soybean will come in as a protein source. We try to diversify the diet a little bit. And uh, that we try to diversify the diet a little bit. And uh, we start with the, the starter diet. We have more soybean meal as we go to grower, we're reducing the soybean meal. And as we go to a maintenance diet, we even reduce that even more. And one of the things that we look at is that we're trying to make sure that we, we use a good vitamin printer or premix in there. We're in the business of making feathers, so we're going to add a methionine to the diets as the birds are growing. And uh, the maintenance diets are less, are a little less in, in, uh, in the amount of protein sources we are. But one of the things, and I'm sorry you can't see this on the bottom of the slide, but at the, at the bottom, we not only have wheat middlings, but oats in the maintenance diet. In the maintenance diet, we're introducing different types of nutrients or uh, nutrient sources, such as wheat middlings and oats. But why do we do that? We're trying to make sure that the birds are met. Here in this example, those sample diets, we have a, a, a high protein diet in the starter, which we would feed for six weeks. We then step down protein a little bit down to 21%. And we also are balancing for methionine and menethionine and cysteine because feathers are, are mainly uh, protein and cysteine as the main pro, uh, amino acid in there. So we're gonna balance for amino acids. We also wanna build some frames. So we're gonna have some calcium and phosphorus in the proper ratio. And we're going to have some energy. When we move over to the maintenance diet, we're going to lower the protein, but we are going to uh, lower the, uh, the uh, energy as well. But what the main thing is that that maintenance diet is used to introduce different feedstuffs to the, to the bird. And then the breeder diets are diets that are 
are uh, high in calcium for eggshells and uh, have a little bit more uh, protein than you would in the maintenance diet. But these are all diets that are going to meet the bird's needs. You cannot emphasize enough that you have to have quality diets in order to produce good quail. And again, the quail is closer to nutritional needs of a turkey than it is to a chicken. Here's an example of a production system where it's in a old commercial chicken house where you have uh, feed lines and you have water lines and you have the birds on the floor. This is a good way of raising birds for meat production because you have the things that it needs. You can heat the birds in, in this particular case as a whole house uh, brooder system, or you can do conventional brooding where you have small groups of, of, of quail. You have a watering system and you have your feed system. It has the things that you need to get the bird off to a good start is heat, water, and feed. We can also look in that they're on a, uh, looks like a wood shavings. That's a good particle size for the bird so they don't eat it. It's a, it's a, new, uh, it's a new bedding in this particular way. Raising birds on the floor can be done. It's a little more uh, important that you practice biosecurity, keeping out some of the aneritic and coccidiosis from the flock. Or you can use a battery brooder where you have a combined system where the birds can be raised in a cage system like this. This will work for starting or raising birds for meat, may not be the ideal situation for going past a few weeks for birds that you're raising for flight. So this is a system that you can get a lot of birds in a small area but we're able to control the temperature, the feed and the water that the birds get. What are some of the minimum space requirements that we need for these birds? Well, the first thing is floor space. If you remember back to the regulations that I talked about, one of the things that, we talk, that is in that regulation is one bird per square foot. That is a good spacing requirement. Feeder space is about an inch per bird, water space about three inches per bird. So all those things are the amount of space that we need. We wanna make sure that the birds can all eat and drink at the same time because of the fact that they can be cannibalistic. We also wanna make sure that uh, we, we, the birds have places that they can get away from one another if they get to have a problem. One of the things that we need to discuss in, in space requirement is making sure they have enough floor space, enough feeder space, enough water space is the prevention of cannibalism. Cannibalism can be a problem particularly in birds that are aggressive. The type of bird that you want for your flight birds are the type that may have a problem with cannibalism. The things that we can do to prevent cannibalism, again, a good quality diet, a, you can beak trim the birds uh, after uh, about four to six weeks to control cannibalism. We can also use quail bits in the, uh, in the uh, nasal passages as a way to uh, keep the beak from closing completely. And we can also make sure we raise the birds with dim light, which is not going to be possible if they have access, uh, outside access. But making sure those things are, are there will help prevent the cannibalism. 
And also you can put in things that are uh, dis uh, the distractions, things like uh, bales of straw of hay, alfalfa hay, things like that, where they get to pick or distractions like hanging shiny objects like Coke cans or CDs, anything that gets their mind off of it. But as the birds get older, you need to make sure there's places for them to get away from each other. Here's an example of a flight pen. We talked about the, the beginning, the brooding there and a flight pen like this. If you are looking at that, uh, what are the things you see that you are, are, that are important? One is that it is a top flight pen, of course. It's enclosed with, a, uh, with the, uh, the netting that's necessary. It uh, has, the sides are solid to prevent predators from getting into the netting. But again, this is not foolproof in the flight pen. It's got good length because you're trying to teach the birds to fly and you want to get the birds exercise by doing that. So this is a, a relatively uh, inexpensive in regard to expense uh, way of creating a flight pen. Here's an example of a hoop barn that's a flight pen. You have, and but this one has a, something unique in this one is the birds are raised on wire. While there is a, a debate about whether you get better flight pan, birds from birds raised on the floor or a sand floor versus raised on a wire, an easy way to control enteritic diseases is to raise them on wire. This is a nice flight pen because it has some characteristics that uh, you may want in your facilities. One, you have uh, all weather feeders that are uh, in there. You also have all weather waterers. You also have places where the birds can get away from each other. You also have screening on the side that act as blinders, which uh, prevents the birds from becoming accustomed to people or dogs or animals. You have uh, a good long uh, uh, flight. You have the ability to get in there and work. Now, you also have your droppings going through so your pens stay cleaner. This is not a bad situation. It's going to be providing distractions to the bird as well as getting them the, the type of location you want to be in. We also have that it, since it has opening us to the sun, the ground cover underneath is going to grow through there. So eventually you'll have the ground cover coming through there. Here's an example of a, a same type of building with uh, ground uh, being on the ground. In this particular one, there's the ground, the ground cover is being uh, a situ uh, starting to be established. It gives the places the birds to get away from each other. It also gets the birds used to uh, uh, the idea of a ground cover when if they're released or if they uh, do survive uh, of, of their flights. It also has the sides that protect the birds from viewing humans. And it, the only problem is when you have this type of system versus th uh, this type of system, you have the birds in contact with fecal material. So there, the fecal material is a source of the infections. So we have to be very careful when we're raising birds on the ground to prevent those enteritic diseases and prevent uh, disease problems. This is a, uh, another type of, of, uh, of flight pen. This is a little more sturdier one. 
And you can see if things work, you have the birds in flight. The one thing I don't like in this picture is the ground cover that they use. I am not a fan of using corn as ground cover or as a feed source or as a natural source in the, in the pens because a corn has a tendency or higher tendency than other crops for mycotoxins. And mycotoxins can wipe you out very easily by causing uh, problems in your flock. So a corn to me is one of the last resorts as a ground cover. You're better off using some of the milos that are non-bird resistant, some of the uh, some of the the rye, some of the pearl millets are all good things to seed a, a flight pen with. Corn, again, there is always the risk of aflatoxins. But again, what we like about this one is it's protected on the sides. We also have the birds are getting their exercise, so they're developing their flight muscles as well as their flight feathers. Quail are susceptible to diseases just like any other uh, poultry. And the same things that call, prevent diseases in chickens or turkeys will prevent diseases in quail. One is a reliable source of the chicks, the eggs, and the parent stock. Again, we cannot emphasize enough of getting birds from a reliable source that you have you know, even if you have to visit the source, make sure you get a reliable source and you continue to uh, get them from a reliable source. Day old chicks or hatching eggs need to come from an MPIP certified flock. So uh, from a certified breeder, this is very important because not only are you going to be regulated like poultry from the state, you also probably have some regulations related to that in your div division of natural resources. Another way to break disease is to separate birds from different ages. If you're using, if you're having multiple ages on a flock, it's always good to, uh, to uh, have the bird segregated by age, especially if there's large differences on the ages of the birds on your farm because uh, the younger birds will be more naive to diseases. The older birds have been exposed to more things. They can easily transmit diseases back to the young birds. So our rule is always work your youngest pens first and work your older pens last. All in, all out is always a good idea. Uh, and that can be done on a quail farm if you think of multiple pens or multiple flight pens, having not, not bringing different birds into all at different spots. Treating each pen as a single entity will help break a disease cycle. Litter management is also important, especially... especially when we're dealing with uh, birds on the ground, making sure that we, we keep a sanitary condition. And especially in flight pens where uh, you need to have good drainage of your flight pens so you don't have piles of, you don't have puddles or wet spots in that flight pen. Don't mix species. And that applies uh, that uh, specifically applies to bringing different species onto a farm. You can have uh, different types of gains birds, but keep them separate from each other. Same with chickens and turkeys uh, being exposed to the quail. It's, it's, it helps may, uh, prevent diseases. Isolate your breeder flocks. If you're going to breed your own quail chicks, Make sure the breeders are separated and, and are isolated 
particularly from uh, other uh, other birds. Uh, you also want, again, the good feed. Quality feed is very important. It gets very frustrating uh, if you're a quail producer and you're, get, you're, you're marketing your release birds in particular at a age of 13 weeks or longer and you start having to pay two and three and four months of feed to those birds, sometimes it gets frustrating. Don't cheat on the feed. Make sure you have good feed. If you're raising flight birds, you might want to introduce them into uh, partial times when you give them some whole grains or uh, ground grains as a way of introducing them. A nighttime feeding at the end of the day would not hurt, but only something that they can clean up rather rapidly. Potable water uh, is very important as well. Uh, precision vaccination program will also prevent uh, problems. It's important to know what problems you have on your farm. If you're maintaining those birds and you don't have any problems, there's no need to vaccinate. But once you start getting a problem, you may want to vaccinate the, the flocks. And really one of the bigger problems is traffic. No visitors or limited traffic on your farm. And this becomes, especially an operation that's selling flight birds. You're bringing those birds somewhere or someone's coming to your farm to pick up birds. The one thing you never want to do is let somebody bring their crates into your flight pens. And if you do, or if you're delivering birds with your, your flight pens, make sure you wash uh, with your transportation pens or uh, coops, make sure you clean them between the time you bring, uh, before you bring them back. Again, one of the ways that transmit diseases is having people bring their coops to your farm and you bring them into the pen to catch the birds. Always think about that. Always think about where's that person been? Where's that item I'm bringing into my flight pens or onto my farm's bin before you let somebody onto your farm? So with that, the quail is a profitable part of agriculture. We've had many successful quail producers in the state, but there are things we have to remember along the way. So if you're raising quail, whether it's for meat where you're producing an animal that is gonna be in human consumption, you need to make sure that you uh, are raising them in a safe manner Never use any product that is not approved for quail in your diets or in your operation. You're raising a food product if you're raising quail for meat. Same as, as with flight, because more than likely they're going to be released and they're going to be consumed. So in summary, uh, what we know about raising meat and, and birds for flight is know the regulations. Do not get caught without knowing what the regulations in your state are. Start with quality birds. Make sure that the genetics that you're buying is the genetics you need for a good end product. The end of the, what is the purpose of the birds? Find a reliable source of the birds so that you can continue an operation throughout the year if you so desire. Make sure they have proper housing that protects the birds from the environments in the first three weeks. Then if you're gonna let them out, make sure that the weather itself is, is proper for it. Make sure you have a clean water supply and it's delivered in a clean way. Make sure you have quality feed, 
and that you clean up after the feed. A good biosecurity bur uh, plan in place where you're going to make sure that nothing comes onto your farm that you don't want on that farm. And you think about where the those things, people and things are before you let them on your farm. Disease prevention, you need to tailor your vaccination programs to diseases that are prevalent in your farm. But disease prevention, whether it's adding a, a, a pharmaceutical product, make sure it's cleared for quail production. And a good way to break disease is to raise the birds on wire. And then a reliable market. You're in the uh, experience, whether it's the quality of the meat for the diner who is going to be eating that meat, or is it for the hunter that's going to have a hunting experience based on the ability of your uh, birds being able to fly the quality of the experience is what you're selling. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you may have. We haven't had any questions so far. So if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, Dr. Pescatori has got to run quickly. So um, if you have any questions, uh, our webinar next month is on home remedies, what to do and not to do. So that might be an interesting one to, to look at uh, if you're uh, looking for our webinars. So, so far, no, no questions. Oh, I did, I had a question. The, the um, facility from North Carolina with the, that's like a, raising them like broilers. Yeah. Um, do they still need a wildlife permit for that? Yes. Okay. It's, and not, no, it's not raising, it's having them in your possession. Okay. And that's the important thing to remember. It's, it's the fact that you possess them. Okay. And um, they have to remember as well that they have to have a place to process the chicken. Yes. That, uh, and that is very much state to state with your regulations as to what you are allowed to do with the processing of poultry. Um, I think quail is one of the ones that's voluntary. So you have to actually pay for USDA inspection for quail. So, any questions? I'm not seeing any yet. Okay, well, not seeing any questions. This met, this was recorded. I saw a few people that came go in and out. Um, I assume that is from uh, internet connections. Uh, it is recorded, it will be posted shortly. Um, and I hope we'll see you next month. I'm gonna stop the recording. Yeah.